The cast of Friends reunited for a special on HBO Max, and I had to bring in Saul Austerlitz, author of Generation Friends, to discuss what makes the show so endearing. Hi, Saul. Thanks for joining us. Looking back on this show more than 25 years later, how did it wind up being this cross-generational phenomenon? Pretty surprising. Of all the television shows of the 1990s, Friends has ended up being the one that has really stood the test of time and has continued to find new fans. You know, lots of shows from that era, the, the people who watched them when they were on are still loyal to them, still enjoy them, still come back to them when they're now on streaming platforms. But Friends remarkably has found new generations of fans, including teenagers who, you know, weren't alive when the show first uh, came on the air, and now teenagers who weren't even alive when the show went off the air. Um, and I think that speaks to something of the show's aspirational qualities. Why do you think they went for this variety show special reunion rather than attempting a new episode? I spoke to some of the show's creators last year for an article I did, and the sense that I got was that the complexity of bringing the show back, like for actual scripted episodes, was too great and the risks were too high to make it worth their while. Friends is an incredibly valuable property and the thought of damaging it by coming back with episodes that people didn't like, I think was was pretty high. And I spoke to Kevin Bright, who's one of the creators of the show, and I think he said something really interesting, which is that, you know, Friends started off as a show about people in their 20s, and then it expanded and it became a show about people in their early 30s. And if you were to bring back Friends now, it would be a show about people in their 50s. So you have two choices. One is you'd have people in their 50s acting like people in their 20s, which I think would be very odd and awkward. Or it would be a show about people who are genuinely in their 50s, which could be a really good show. It just wouldn't be friends. In hindsight, some of the show's flaws, like a lack of diversity, are quite obvious. Do you think a reboot would help or should we just accept it for what it is? You know, it's a product of its era. And I think that it has a lot of positive qualities and clearly has touched a chord with viewers um, who still find reason, find comfort in it. Um, I think also it has some of the limitations of its era. And, and, you know, even in going through the coverage of the show in the media from the 1990s, there's a lot of discussion of the lack of diversity um, and the ways in which the show wasn't up to the standard, even of some of the dramatic series of the 1990s. I, I could see creating a new version of Friends and, you know, or, or new show and just kind of calling it Friends 2.0. But I think in terms of the original show itself, it is what it is. Your book details how many ways the cast almost didn't come together or stay together over the years. How did the bond between all six characters really impact the show? It was pretty standard practice at the time that when a show became a hit, you know, especially a show that had multiple main performers, um, the networks would reach out to kind of the breakout performers and say, hey, you're doing a great job. We'd love to bump you up and, you know, in, uh, increase your salary. Uh, and everything was very secretive and, you know, um, cast members wouldn't know what their fellow cast members were being paid. And David Schwimmer, when he was approached after the first season of Friends, along with Jennifer Aniston, and was asked, you know, was told, you know, we want to give you a big, a big pay increase. Uh, he instead went back to his fellow cast members and said, I think we should all go in and negotiate together. And I think that was a really crucial decision. Um, it obviously, it, it may have cost him a small sum in the short run. In the long run, I think it benefited all of them a lot in terms of their payout from the show. But I think also it greatly reduced the natural friction that occurs on shows like these where performers become kind of jealous of each other or feel like they're being underpaid or undervalued. Here, since everyone was being paid and in lockstep and negotiating in lockstep, um, it made it more complicated for the network in terms of not being able to play them off each other. But I think it, it benefited the show in the long run. Thanks so much for joining us, Saul. And now the Friends Reunion has us in the nostalgic move, so it's time for a little drinking game. The next up, you wind up binging the show. Why not do some binge drinking? <laughs> Whether your beverage of choice is a Central Perk Americano or a margarita, drink every time one of these situations comes up. Every time somebody breaks up or hooks up or was on a break. I think it's safe to say that our friendship is effectively ruined. Eh, we weren't that close anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Every time someone uses a different character's catchphrase. Could I be wearing any more clothes? Every time you think, I definitely wear that, about one of their costumes. <laughs> I'm 
Bush Bush. Every time you Google one of the guest stars to see what they're up to lately. You are not in a perfect world. You in a museum now. <laughs> and finally, if you want to have a really wild night, take a drink every time Ross is the absolute worst. We were on the break. Just don't accidentally get married in Vegas after playing. 